This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. The next three days are going to be hectic. We got the final couple days of the NHL regular season coming up. Tomorrow, we have the final NBA play-in games. And on Saturday, the full NBA playoffs begin. It's going to be crazy, going to be wild, going to be a lot to bet. So we're going to have Tom Vecchio on today to break down his thoughts on both the final or second to last night in the NHL and also talk about tomorrow's play-in games and the NBA playoffs on a Saturday. Welcome on into covering the spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire. Joined here as mentioned by Tom Vecchio. Check him out on Twitter at DFS underscore Tom. Thomas, this, I think this is the first time we talked to you since Quinnipiac won the Frozen Four. Uh, so national champions, have you come down from the high end? Uh, no, thank you. It, it certainly uh, was an exciting game, obviously, winning 10 seconds into overtime after, you know, coming back down from 2-0 uh, is great to see. You know, third time in the last 10 years they were in the national championship. They finally got a win. Uh, it should only point up for recruiting and continuing to build the program. So I am doing awesome. You know, my friends and I obviously were all talking about the game. Very exciting. We wish we could have been there. Wish they could have won when we were seniors when they were there for the first time. But nonetheless, it's great to see a win. Yeah, I'm curious what the more Minnesota moment was losing an, a championship game in OT with 10, 10 seconds in or blowing a huge lead in a play in game um, a couple nights later. It's so, I mean, tough. They're, they're both up there. Yeah, they're both very Minnesotan. Um, <laughs> it's 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 rough, uh, but I'm glad that the benefactor of Minnesota being its typical sports self uh, was Quinnipiac and you. So congrats, Tom. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed that. And now you get a crazy sports schedule for the next 55, I don't know, whatever, math, hours uh, until the NBA playoffs begin. So you got to be jazzed about that, too, with all the NHL and the NBA uh, really hitting their peak right now. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is a time where, uh, you know, depending on how you view the NBA or if you're, you know, not into the NBA at all. You know, a lot of people don't pay attention on a day to day basis in the regular season. Like this is the time where you can you know, see these high leverage games, high leverage moments that you know provide the best of the action that we should see the best of the stars and really present a, an awesome betting opportunity. Yeah, and we're going to talk about that, uh, both the Friday play-in games, we'll talk Saturday's games, talk some futures, and much more. Then we'll dive in to the NHL slate later on, all right here on the show for today. But first, a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. Yesterday, we talked to Dr. Ed Fang to talk about some NFL draft betting. We talked about a prop that he likes there. Also talked about ways you can bet NBA, despite not knowing it as well as Tom May. Uh, talked about some tools that Ed and I both use for that. Find that on the Covering the Spread podcast feed and over on the FanDuel YouTube page. Speaking of the NBA playoffs, they are here. You can turn crossovers into cash with FanDuel. Just visit FanDuel right now and place a $5 bet, and you'll get an instant $150 in bonus bets, win or lose. There is no better place to bet all the playoff action than America's number one sportsbook. Just go to FanDuel and sign up to get $150 in bonus bets when you bet your first $5. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA, must be 21 plus and present in select states. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino LLC. Bonus issued is non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit fanduel.com slash RG. In Massachusetts, hope is here. Gambling helpline ma.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support. In New York, 1-877-8-HOPE-N-Y or text HOPE-N-Y. In Arizona, 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text NEXT STEP to 53342. In Connecticut, 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. In Wyoming, Kansas, 1-800-522-4700. Or in Kansas, ksgamblinghelp.com. Louisiana is 1-877-770-STOP. In Maryland, mvgamblinghelp.org. And in West Virginia, go to 1-800-GAMBLER.net. 
Now we're going to begin things for today, Tom, talking about the final NBA play-in games on Friday. We got the Bulls and the Heat and the Thunder and the Wolves trying to redeem themselves that uh, back on Tuesday night. When you look at these two games, Tom, any bets you want to lock in right now? Yeah, starting off, the under 227.5 for OKC in Minnesota, we should see Rudy Gobert return from Minnesota. Obviously, uh, altercation with the teammate is suspended for one game. This is not official yet, but you know we saw the line for Minnesota versus the Lakers. That line was was super high, and you know Rudy Gobert is obviously a very good defender. And it, you know, especially presuming that he does return, you know this line I think is at a good spot, but it's definitely trending towards the under, at least in my mind, with the matchups, specifically what we saw with Minnesota against the Lakers, where they slowed things down a lot. I mean, this game went that game went to overtime. And we're ending with like under 120 points, which is not yeah. something we traditionally see in the NBA, especially in today's the way today's game is played. So 227 and a half, I think, is a touch too high compared to the other game. I mean, 208, I think, might be the lowest over under I've seen literally all season. So if we're going to continue to see these unders, I want to jump in now at, at 227 and a half. And listen, for the Heat, I, I, and if we just like take the step back of like the Heat first game, that total is 228 versus the Hawks, and that has dropped 20 points. Obviously, I'm not expecting this total to drop 20 points, but just under that same assumption where people are expecting points, they're expecting all these stars to be out there, but that's not the way the teams operate in the playoffs. They try and play a much more controlled style, and that does not you know, tend to lead to a lot of scoring. And that was one thing Brandon discussed on our show on Tuesday was the slower pace in the NBA playoffs. And that manifested for the under, like you said, despite OT for the Wolves and Lakers, also the under for uh, the Heat game there as well. So you're liking the under 227 and a half uh, for the Wolves and the Thunder for that later game on Friday. Anything for you in the Bulls Heat or is that one pretty efficiently priced in your eyes? Yeah, that, that was looking pretty good to me. I was looking at some of the player props in that one, and this is one of the tough spots. It's like, you know, Zach Levine was super efficient last night for the Bulls. He was 12 of 22 from the field, you know, didn't need to get a whole lot from downtown. He's always been a very efficient mid-range shooter getting to the basket. And I think his points prop is at a good spot tonight. And he's a high usage, high shooter, you know, high, high volume shooter for the Bulls. It's like, I don't want to take an over on a player that right. I'm expecting where a game has a 208 over under. I'm not expecting a ton of points. So I think everything is super, super tight in that game. And ultimately it's probably just the stay away for me. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so for the Friday games, we are liking the under there for the Wolves and the Thunder at 227.5. Now, the fun thing with being here, Tom, is that we have these two games to finalize things, but most of the matchups are set uh, for the playoffs in the NBA, and we've got futures. We've got finals markets, conference champion markets. We've got individual series markets as well. When you look at the futures markets, Tom, broadly, anything you like that you want to get set before tip-off on Saturday? Yes. Starting off, that would be Devin Booker finals MVP at 20-1. to 1. And I spoke about this on Tuesday when I did a segment with Stadium for their playoff preview. And you know, betting on a finals MVP when we're two months out is obviously a, a very unique thing. It's obviously tough. The team needs to make it there. So ultimately, I want to look for a combination of A, a team that has a high probability to make it to the finals, and then you know B, a player that has the potential to win, and obviously C, we want good odds. All these things rolled into one. So right now, the Suns are plus 190 coming out of the West. They're the favorites coming out of the West. So you know we are in a, I would say, a good spot right from the jump. And then if we just look at the differential between Devin Booker at 20 to 1 and Kevin Durant sitting there at 7 to 1, mm -hmm. that like kind of implies and, and what I said in the segment was like that kind of implies like it's number one for Durant and Devin Booker is the number two option in their offense when that's not the case it's like a 1A 1B scenario on any given night it's like Booker's going for 40 Durant can obviously go for 40 where the prices are too far apart for their actual roles on the court and the production we can see from Booker. We've seen Booker in the finals a couple of seasons ago against the, the Bucs when he's putting up 40 points. So I like Booker just from a fundamental standpoint where I think the line and the differential between him and Durant is just too large. Right. And it's one thing where you could say, OK, the narrative here is Durant joins a team midseason and kind of catalyzes a, a finals run. But that's baked in here with uh, with Durant at seven to one and Booker at twenty one or twenty to one. 
that's a big gap. And I think it sounds like in your eyes, they're fully accounting for the narrative advantage that KD may have here. Right. And I think Durant's number is certainly perfect where it is. It's seven to one. That's probably where it should be given, you know, Tentacumbo and Embiid and all these players are still right. here. Steph Curry, et cetera, et cetera. But like, again, that differential implies like that there are two different like ceilings of players when Booker can reach a 40 point ceiling in finals game. So right. I think jumping on a, a differential, regardless of what the outcome might be, I think it's still like objectively a good spot. And we have a large enough sample on KD with the Suns too to know that Booker does not disappear. So I think that that is beneficial there as well. Okay, so for futures, like in Booker, 20 to 1 to win the finals MVP, which you can find in the NBA finals tab over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Any futures, other futures you like here, Tom, before we talk about Saturday's games? Sure, and and I, I'm going to use the Nets and the 76ers playoff series pricing as an overall example. And mm-hmm. I think it does present a good example, but I just want to use like this concept overall. So the 76 is reminded it's 800 on the money line to win the series. No, I'm not betting that. I don't think many people are. And then you're you're like, okay, what if I t- took the spread, the series spread? Well, it's minus two and a half and it's minus 162 for the 76 ers You're like, uh, I'm probably not betting that as well. But what does minus two and a half mean? They have to win by three games, right? So if you look to the exact series predictions, right? It, it, the, uh, in terms of the exact outcomes of the series, mm-hmm. the 76ers at f- winning four to one or winning four zero, those are both at plus money. And that implies that they're winning by three. Mm-hmm. So just like using this as an example, if you want to put like half a unit on each or, or whatever it might be, you are getting that minus two and a half if you nail that exact series score. So just because this is this minus 800 is so large, it's minus two and a half, it's minus 162. Like I'm not betting those. If I try and just nail the exact series score, we're getting them all at solid plus money. So that's the route to try and use in a lot of playoff series for both NBA and NHL, where you have to find that alternate market that does provide value based on what the odds are telling us. Like the odds are telling us the 76ers are going to dominate the series. How do we take advantage of that for the most plus money? It's going to be at four to one or four zero series exact score. Right. And I think that that's a good takeaway always Uh, with series markets, finding the best route to bet your assumption. Your assumption is the markets are properly pricing in the Sixers. How can I take advantage of that? But then also with player props, with markets, with spreads and stuff like that. I have this assumption. What is the best route for betting that? Because we have the typical markets, but you've got a full menu. So take advantage of that and use that to your advantage, weaponize that because we don't get a lot of legs up uh, in, in betting. Um, We are at a disadvantage pretty often, but make sure you are fully exploiting the good advantage you get in this regard. Now I want to focus on Saturday, Tom, before we talk about the individual games, player props and stuff like that, there is a pretty big adjustment here from talking about worrying about playing time down the stretch to going to the playoffs where, uh uh-oh, Uh, That is no longer a concern. We are going the opposite way. So how aggressive are you in upping minutes projections in your mind for key players? Uh, What about role players? How do you adjust for them? How are you making those manual adjustments in your brain to make sure you're accounting for new expectations and high leverage games? Yeah, so this is always an interesting question, the difference between regular season NBA and postseason NBA and the examples that I'll use, I hate to cherry pick box scores, but it just shows what I'm trying to say so, so clearly. And it's in these uh, few most recent games between the Hawks and the Heat and the Bulls and the Raptors, you know, games that took place the past two nights. So for the Heat in that game, they had five players come off the bench, but three of those players played nine minutes or fewer, nine, four, and three minutes. That means they had two key players come off the bench, played 29 and 33 minutes. They were essentially running a seven man rotation and the exact same thing for the bulls where they had five players come off the bench. Three of those players played four five and six minutes. The other two players played 25 and 25 minutes. So we are seeing extremely tight rotations. Now, what does this do for the starters and for the key players? Someone who I already mentioned, Zach Levine, you know, super efficient shooter from the field, high usage player, primary player, all these sorts of things. He averaged just about 36 minutes per game this season. Last night he played 40. So, and I said this at the deadline in terms of the minutes, it's like, okay, what does an extra three or four minutes do? But when we have a high usage player, you know, he's going to be taking an extra three, four, five field goal attempts. Zach Levine can be very effective from downtown. He's going to be piling up the assists. When you take a PRA bet 
on these players that may only be seeing four extra minutes, you know, that could be, you know, six, seven touches on the ball. That could be two assists, you know, two, three pointers, whatever it might be. So everything is going to be tightened just a little bit. And I'd be willing to go to these high usage players again for PRA bets, just because they can do so many different things. So when it comes to the role players, I am shying them out from point props, but rebounding plop props, they're obviously going to be very effective, especially if we see lower scoring games, because lower scoring games mean turnovers, mean more missed shots, mean more rebounds. So, you know, someone like, I don't know, PJ Tucker on, on the 76ers, if, if you are betting on the NBA or you're playing NBA DFS, or like PJ Tucker could go 10 games in a row and score a total of 10 points. Like that's not even an exaggeration, but he plays 35 minutes a night and he's piling up the right. rebounds. So I'll never look to him for points, but the rebounding prop could still be there depending on the game environment. Are you pulling a Clint Capella here and looking for like an alt rebound over 20? Like, are we doing that with PJ Tucker? You know, Just, uh, uh, maybe, not PJ, for these? <laughs> maybe not PJ Tucker, but yeah, you can ladder some of the, uh, some of the, the the rebounding props that could be for someone like Rudy Gobert, who mm-hmm. who can put up 15, 18 rebounds in some of these games. Uh, I mean, going forward, uh, maybe it's Embiid, maybe it's Jokic, like whatever it might be. Like we are going to see heavy minutes for them, and that just means more consistency. And the projections you can bump them up ten percent, right? Uh, you know, across the board. How much does the decreased pace negate the impact of increased minutes? Because pace hurts everything, but then you do have three or four extra minutes, which matters a lot, like you said. So does that weigh in for you as well, the reduced pace in the postseason? It does. And and like I said, it's it's reduced pace, extra minutes, but extra minutes on only high usage players are what I want to be focusing yeah. in on. So right. uh, like Kentavious Caldwell-Pope on Denver is a really effective three-point shooter, but he's never the primary ball handler. And oftentimes he's fifth on the team in usage. It's Jokic, Murray, Gordon, Michael Porter Jr., then KCP. So just because he happens to be seeing an extra five minutes doesn't necessarily translate to actual production. Yeah. Okay. So it's important to, to weigh those things in your mind, kind of know the dynamic roles people may have, uh, whether that role will be scaled back at all, stuff like that. Factor in pace, factor in everything. I know it's overwhelming, but it is necessary if you want to find a good edge here in the postseason. Now, we do have player props up for these Saturday games over at FanDuel Sportsbook. They were kind enough to uh, release those pretty early. So when you look at the games on Saturday, Tom, where are you seeing value right now? Starting off that first game, uh, Nick Claxton of the Brooklyn Nets under nine and a half rebounds, minus 125. The, he's the starting center for the Nets. We don't necessarily see the Nets with a ton of size on a nightly basis. And we know Joel Embiid is obviously dominant out there, but what Embiid is also very good at, he's good at drawing fouls. And that obviously puts Claxton in a tough spot. So defensively, if Claxton starts racking up the fouls, A, he's not going to see the court, which is great for unders for anything. And then B, if he does start to accumulate some fouls, the Nets might try to, like ice, or not like Iceland, but insulate him away from Embiid and just bring him help right. so he's not piling up uh, the fouls. And obviously, then he's just out of the game. So Claxton is a good rebounder. He's not great. It's a a tough matchup against Embiid, but then also this foul factor really has me hesitant that he's going to even be out there for enough minutes. Uh, he's going to be out there just for enough time to pile up ten rebounds. Right. So that number you mentioned for Claxton under nine and a half minus one twenty five due to. Match with Embiid, the fouls he could draw, uh, pace is also a factor there, obviously, as well. Uh, so Claxton or nine and a half is where he's going there. Any other player props you like on Saturday? Yeah, Domitus Sabonis on the Sacramento Kings under 41 and a half PRA. Points, rebounds, assist, sitting at minus 111. We know that both the Kings and the Warriors are two of the highest scoring teams in the league. The Kings led the league in scoring this year. They're one of the best teams all time when it comes to offensive efficiency. Now, Sabonis averaged 7.3 assists per game for the Kings this season, which led the Kings, the starting center for an NBA team, led them in assists, not the Aaron Fox. That's how good Sabonis is. But what what do we know from the Warriors? Uh, The Warriors have Draymond Green, who's an excellent defender. And ultimately, these teams are kind of mirrors of each other, kind of copies of each other, where Draymond's going to probably look to to take Sabonis out of the game. They're going to try and remove him because he's such a key cog in their offense, facilitating their offense. He leads them in assists. So uh, it's not going to be a surprise to see Curry and and Fox and, you know, Keegan Murray for the Kings set the NBA record for the most three-pointers 
by an NBA rookie. So it's not going to be surprised to see all these guards scoring, but they're going to try and take some bonus away because he's such an important part of their offense. And Draymond, we know, is so good at that. It doesn't, uh, you know, lead me to a lot of confidence in Sabonis, despite him being probably one of my most profitable players all season. And 41 and a half is not a huge number for him either, right? Right. He puts up, tri I mean, he had to set a career high this year for triple doubles. He's racking up, you know, these 20 and 18 games. He adds in his normal seven assists and boom, he's crushing it. But I just don't love the matchup. Despite right. this having a high scoring expectation, it's a particularly individually tough matchup for Sabonis. Okay, so that number on Sabonis for the PRA is under 41 and a half at minus 111 right now at FanDuel. Any final NBA thoughts, Tom, before we shift focus, talk about a massive NHL slate? Uh, no, my, my final thought would be to try and use those alternate markets, as I mentioned with the 76ers and the Nets, to try and, and nail those correct series scores, series total games, whatever it might be. I think that's ultimately what provides a lot of value. And even if you don't have a take on which team is going to win, just like six games total, seven games total, you know, it doesn't matter who wins at that point. You right. just think it's going to be a tight series. Six game total could offer a lot of value there. Yeah. Before you place your bet, ask yourself, is this the best way to exploit the thought I have going in? And that's just, right. again, a general thought, not just for the NBA playoffs. Okay. Let's shift focus now and talk about the NHL, a 15 game slate, the second to last day in the regular season. Tom, my goodness, uh, you've got, so many choices on the board here. When you look at the NHL for tonight, what are your favorite traditional market bets you're locking in for a 15-game slate? So there's certainly a lot to consider tonight. And the first thing I'll say quickly is that all 16 playoff positions are locked up. The seedings okay. are not. So all 16 teams are accounted for with the Isles win last night. They clinched the final Eastern Conference wildcard spot. But the exact seedings for most of them for basically all the matchup except one or two are not finalized. So mm -hmm. we have a lot of high priority games tonight in terms of teams fighting for points. Number one would be the Carolina Hurricanes versus the Florida Panthers under six and a half. It's sitting at minus one Oh six. Both of these teams need points. So there's, and both of them need them for very different reasons. The Panthers last night with that Isles win, the Panthers got jumped. So the Isles had 93 points. The Panthers had 92 points. They're holding down the two wild card spots. The Panthers right now, if they were to lose tonight, that means they play the Bruins in the first round. And I've <laughs> talked about the Bruins before on this podcast where I've literally said it's a shock to see them lose two games in a row. They set a record this year for the most wins in regular season history. So they set a record with the most points by a team in regular season history. They are literally a historic team. No one wants to play them in the first round, which means the Panthers desperately want to win this game and move out of that second wild card spot, which means if they win, they would be playing the Canes in the first round, potentially, depending on what the Devils do against the Capitals. So the Canes also have a priority because they want to lock up the number one seed in their division to have home ice and mean they'd be playing a wild card team. So both of these teams desperately need to win, which means we probably shouldn't see a very back and forth game because this could literally be the playoff matchup, which we see starting next week. So a very, very controlled, non-aggressive defensive style of game is what I'm expecting because these teams cannot take risks. Despite being awesome offenses, they cannot take risks. They have to play this very, very controlled. And that is a lot of motivation. On oh, right. No, no, no one wants be, to play the Bruins. Right. They're not horsing around, which means you can play things pretty straight here. Under six and a half, minus one of six for the Hurricanes and the Panthers. Any other traditional market bets you like tonight, Tom? I like the abs in regulation. It's minus 130. It might be a touch too much for some people at minus 130, but the abs are also a team uh, looking to secure up home ice. They can. They have two games left. They play tonight and tomorrow night. So they, they have technically four points they can gain, which would put them, uh, if they win, if they grab all four points, which would put them to number one in the central. Home ice is great. They know all these sorts of things. So I like them at minus 130. They are coming off a loss. Uh, they should be able to bounce back against the Jets tonight. I would lean the under in this game. It's not one of my picks, but I like the abs in regulation at minus 130. That has shortened to 135. Uh, the traditional money line is minus 205. So not a ton of movement, but there is some there. Yeah, minus 135. Are you still going that way versus the traditional money line at minus 205? Yeah, I would, stay, I would stick with minus 135. I also like the lightning in regulation. It's basically the same line. Yeah, but uh, I, I would stick with the Avs. They have more motivation to win. The, the the Lightning are locked into their spot. 
Okay, so the Lightning traditional money line minus 255 for them, and their 60-minute uh, money line is minus 170. So that's actually shortened a bit too on their end. Uh, sounds like the Avs, your preferred way to go here? Correct. Okay, what about player props? What do you see there for Thursday night? Sticking with the Lightning, it would be Braden Point, their top-line center. He has 49 goals this season. Yeah. Now, his goal odds are very short at plus 104, mm-hmm. which aren't amazing, but they're probably where they should be. I mean, he's going to be a 50-goal scorer going up against the uh, Detroit Red Wings tonight. Also, his shots are only at 2.5, and, and it's minus 122. I was mm-hmm. expecting this line to be a 3.5, you know, maybe at, at like plus, plus 108, plus 104, but it's minus 122 for a player who has 50 goals, 2.5. He's, prim- he's clearly a primary shooter and scorer for them. I'm going to take both point over two and a half shots and point goal to get to the 50 mark in the final game of the season. If you go to the over under goal market for point, it is plus 104 to get over a half goal. So you can get that there. And then the shot market, as you said, is over two and a half minus 122. If you're betting one of those, Tom, preference for you or split it both ways? I'll, I'll go with the goal. The, okay. the, the, they're a team that has obviously a long history. Uh, I'll play into the narrative for the final game of the regular season. 50 goals is a lot, man. I would do the same thing. If I were him, I'm I'm shooting 40 times. Don't care. <laughs> we're, we're gunning for it for sure. Any other player props catching your eye for tonight? The last one would be the Los Angeles Kings. Victor Arvinson over three and a half shots, sitting at plus 110. The Kings also do have motivation to play and win. They do not want to be – they're holding down the three seed right now if – they were to lose and Seattle were to win, the Kings would drop into the wild card. So you don't want to do that. You'd rather have the three seed than a wild card, all these sorts of things. The Kings are still without uh, Kevin Fialo, who's one of their primary shooters. So Victor Arvinson now has a, a very strong offensive role. He's been over this mark uh, and, and can push towards, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine shots as we've seen from him. So very easy match of them against the Ducks, one of the worst defensive teams in the entire league. Uh, I'll take Arvinson over three and a half at plus 110 on a team that has motivation to win. And again, that's for the Kings and the Ducks game later on tonight. Uh, go to the shot market. Victor Arvinson over three and a half is plus 110. Tom, I feel like I've made you run a marathon today. Uh, via uh, all the different markets we discussed. No, it, it's good. Like this is uh, a, a good time where we have some futures we can look at in terms of NBA. Mm-hmm. NHL is closing up. And again, you know, if you're betting on the NHL in these final two days, like stick with the teams that have motivation that need to play and win. Like, right. You know, I, I said to, you know, said to you the other day where like I have the flyers under 73 and a half total points for the season and they're sitting at 73 tonight and they're going up against the worst team in the league against the Blackhawks. I don't want to bet on that. Like I'm not betting on two teams that have nothing to pay, play for. I need the flyers to lose. but I, I, Do I hedge out? Like that's the, that's the conversation I need, now need to have. The one exception is if that team is quarterbacked by Davis Webb, then you can bet on them with true. confidence in week 18, and then he can retire, go off into the sunset. <laughs> we can all be happy. Um, so if, if Davis Webb suits up for the lightning, whatever it may be, feel free to dive on in there. That is Tom Vecchio. Make sure you check him out on Twitter at DFS underscore Tom. Find his work over at number fire. Tom, appreciate the time as always. Uh, have fun with your bets. Enjoy the next couple of days. We'll talk to you once again very soon. Thanks for having me. All right. Appreciate Tom as always. Again, follow on Twitter at DFS underscore Tom. I am on Twitter at Jim Sonis. Back once again tomorrow. We'll talk some EPL, talk some MLB. We'll talk some NASCAR to get you ready for other stuff going on across this weekend. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 